Welcome back to Let's Code. I'm Chris Biscardi. And today we're talking about this monstrosity. That's right. Today we're talking about vertex shaders that pass positional information through a color channel to a fragment shader that interprets textures and normal maps against some simplex noise to create a repeating Swiss cheese dissolve, dissolve effect using Bevy's new material API, also known as the Swiss cheese ball monstrosity of 2022. Now, before we talk about the Swiss cheese ball monstrosity, it's useful to go over the standard material that Bevy's new uh, material APIs uh, powers. You can see this on the bottom left here. We've got a light animating around a sphere. That light is projecting um, you know, light onto the sphere. So we see a shadow on one side and light on the other and the kind of backlit, uh, I forget what you call the circular thing around the edges that <laughs> <laughs> reflect some light back as well. Um, this is also using a concrete texture uh, with a normal map on it. And all of that is uh, like officially supported in Bevy. So on the right here, you can see that we have a couple of different concrete images. Most of these are uh, JPEGs from the Quixel Megascans. And then we've got the single uh, source main.rs file. We've got a setup function that runs on startup. And this function just loads in the concrete texture. So this is just the normal map. Uh, this is also the roughness map here that we're loading in, but we're not, I don't think we're actually using it right now. Um, I was using it when I was experimenting, but we can just ignore that for now. So we have the, the normal map as a JPEG and we have uh, the albedo or albedo, basically just the, the texture that actually looks like concrete, like the colors and stuff. So we get to use this standard material that exists in Bevy's Prelude and we get to set a base color, which I've set to gray, which will combine with this texture to produce the output you see on the left. And that's all we need to do. You can see that we've spawned a mesh in that is a UV spear with a radius of one. And other than that, we've spawned a light in. Uh, and I'm, we animate this light around the sphere, but that's not super, super important or anything. Um, I also have controls to move the actual stuff around a little bit, but it doesn't really change much because it's, you know, it's a concrete sphere. But I wanted to extend this with some of the Perlin noise or simplex noise in this case, algorithms that we've been working with in our other shaders, which turns out to be a little bit more complicated. So this was my first attempt at uh, writing the dissolve shader for a sphere. Now there's a couple problems with this. One is that the dissolve uh, shader itself is actually 2D because I'm using the wrong coordinates. In this case, I think I'm using the uh, pixel coordinates because it's a fragment shader and that's what we have access to. But really in the end result, what I wanted to do was use the vertex coordinates, which we'll go over uh, in, a, in a little bit here. But basically using the pixel coordinates on the screen means that we only get to interact with the pixels, right? So the result that we get out of this is a 2D texture mapped onto those pixels. And we still have a bunch of the PBR stuff happening. So in this case, we've got this custom material struct that we've implemented with time, which is how we're doing the dissolve effect with the, uh, simplex noise and some blend modes and some other stuff that I was trying to get to work. This didn't really ever achieve what I wanted it to. Um, so I kind of put it down and went with a different direction. I just wanted to point out that it is possible to do completely from scratch uh, shader implementations. This array texture, that WGSL file here, is almost directly from uh, the array texture example in the Bevy repo. So I kind of pulled that in. I pulled in a bunch of imports and stuff like that. Um, I defined my custom material. So when we go from Rust to the GPU, we still need to kind of have a struct there to contain that data. Uh, I'm kind of skipping over this because I'll go into it in more depth in a second when we go with the final. And then this calls a couple of the PBR inputs. I just, the, really the thing that I wanted to get across is that there are sort of modular functions that you can use to achieve kind of more realistic rendering. Um, if you have the arguments that you need to pass in. So in this case, it creates a new PBR input and it sets a base color for the material and some fragment coordinates and world positions and normals and things like that. And then here's where our noise algorithm gets in. Um, our noise algorithm is basically uh, taking the output of the realistic rendering for the sphere and using that as a base color. We do a 1 500th step of noise. So for every fragment coordinate, X, Y, and Z, we divide by 500 to get some value between zero and one, um, which looks nice in this case. We loop the actual dissolve animation. So you'll see that this actually is the same dissolve animation over and over. 
And what we're doing here is actually using a sine wave to cause that. So we're using sine on the time, which goes from negative one to one to negative one to one. So it's a it's a looping thing, which is nice for, you know, putting on Twitter, or TikTok or whatever. We use a couple of functions that are provided by WGSL, like step and smooth step. <laughs> and then we take the uh, edge color that we've defined here and we combine it with the base color. And that's really it. It's, it's that simple. We basically take the noise texture. Um, it is a single noise texture for the entire, uh, how do we say this? The entire sphere, really. Um, and then we just animate from the base state to the texture state and back. And we set basically some thresholds. And when it hits the threshold on one side, we kind of discard it and it's not there anymore. Uh, and then we've got a border around the rest of the pieces. And uh, yeah, I don't know, that's it. But it doesn't do everything that I wanted it to do, right? Like it, this doesn't accept a normal map because I never implemented the ability for my custom material to accept a normal map. So you can see we've got some uh, pipeline specialization here. I've tried to set the call mode because I thought that that would help to uh, view the back faces. So if, he, if I run this again, actually, you can see that the sphere that we see is only the front half of the sphere. We don't see the back half of the sphere, uh, which is something that I was really trying hard to fix and couldn't really figure it out. Now, I went from all of this because I thought I was doing stuff wrong to a much more comprehensive um, solution. So in our dissolve sphere for, yes, that one. So in the dissolve sphere that we use in the, you know, Swiss cheese monstrosity, you can see that we have the back faces of the sphere coming in. Uh, it's a little easier to see when it's lit. Um, and we can see that the texture is wrapping around the sphere rather than being a 2D texture on top of the pixels. And we do that by uh, implementing a vertex shader. So inside of lib.rs, I've basically got a direct copy paste of the file that defines all of the standard material structs with the addition of time. So time is really important for us. It's not included in, you know, any of the standard material structs or anything like that. So we have to add it here. I ran into a bunch of issues where I, I used 11 here um, before I used 12 and that wasn't working <laughs> because apparently the order for some of these things matters. So if you look at the, the standard extensions that WGSL, uh, I also had time on the bottom here on line like 14. And for some reason, time needed to be on the top on line five. Otherwise, I got this like super red. Actually, let's see if I can reproduce it. Like if I put time on the bottom here, then everything is clearly out of order. So the order of the structs as you define them matters and you have to match that up as far as I'm aware against the bind group data. Otherwise, you get just basically something being wrong, right? Like the time isn't animating here. Clearly, uh, we've got a static dissolve of like a single frame. And that's because the time is on the bottom here which is really disorienting. Like there's nothing to tell you that you did anything wrong here. So I've found working with these shaders um, hard to debug, which makes it hard for me to recommend them to like more beginner programmers because you kind of have to have an intuition for like the kinds of things that can go wrong. And then you have to spend time like going through them and checking like, hey, maybe the field order matters <laughs> is a thing that an experienced programmer might come up with eventually but maybe a beginner programmer really would be stumbling around a little bit more. Um, so I, I will say that debugging shaders is a huge pain um, and it's important to do things step by step. Don't write out a whole bunch of code and then hope that it works. Do things a little bit by a little bit so that when something goes wrong, you know what piece of code you wrote last that made it go wrong. But this is all other than that, uh, basically a copy paste of a bunch of different files. Um, Going back to the RS file or lib.rs, the only real modification in this entire file is that I've added time uh, and I've modified the two shaders. So by default, there's this PBR shader handle that comes from Bevy that defines the uh, standard.wgsl kind of like mesh.wgsl file. I've commented that out here uh, because I was testing and I've used a different vertex shader and a different fragment shader. So we use these in combination to achieve the wrapping effect of the noise around the sphere. And other than that, it's very similar. Like uh, we've got this huge import kind of path here uh, to get the standard material from our library instead of from the default standard material. So 
we can do things like change the base color from that horrid, awful Swiss cheese yellow to something that looks maybe a little bit more bluish, like concrete. This is a, a little bit purple, actually, but, uh, you know, same difference. And you can see that everything updates. So like the, the dissolved borders in this example are based on the base color. We've got the reflections from the light, the point lights in the top here, the red and the uh, blue. And we've got all these shadows working and things like that, which are awesome. So by copying and pasting the standard material and then kind of extending it rather than writing everything from scratch, I was able to support a lot of the behavior that I wanted to see, right? So now we've got a base color texture that we can use and we pass in uh, the Albedo texture. We've got the normal map texture here and we don't have to worry about sending it into the bind group ourselves. And then we've got a bunch of planes and walls and things like that down here. These are kind of less important. Um, they're just kind of lights and walls and things like that. Um, in this example, I'm also using Bevy Asset Loader. It's really important to have your assets actually loaded. Um, although I did just submit a PR to not crash if you don't have them loaded and you go to render uh, a custom texture. So hopefully that'll be merged later today. And this is uh, kind of the, the really important piece here. So to get the, let's, let's touch on the noise first. We're gonna work our way backwards. So in here, there's a little bit of custom code um, just assume that up until this point right here that says custom code on it, that the regular standard material stuff has all happened. We've got our tone mapping, we've got our reflections, we've got um, metallicness and normal maps and all that stuff already applied. So we set our base color for the dissolve shader uh, to the output color of all of that processing. We take the noise step as 5.0 because that seems to work the best in this example. Um, we take the color of the vertex. So this simplex noise three takes three arguments in dot color dot X times noise step in dot color dot Y and in dot color dot Z. This color here is conditionally defined based on whether we have the vertex shader enabled or not. See if I can find it up here even. Um, see this fragment input right here. If there are vertex colors, then we have this color field on the fragment input that we can access. Uh, and we set this in our own vertex shader, but the color that we set here is the vertex position, not a color. So that's a really important note. We'll come back to that. So this is this, basically the same noise algorithm that I showed you earlier. It's the simplex noise. We use time on a sine wave uh, to get that looping effect. We step through the noise with our threshold, or we, <laughs> we step through the threshold with our noise, whichever way you want to like uh, phrase that. And in this case, I've based the edge color on the output color. So the edge color will be a little bit more based on the base color than uh, maybe we could make it. We could make this like just a bright red or something like that. And then we do the combination of the base color and the dissolve border. And if there is a color there uh, that is an alpha greater than zero, we display the color. If not, we discard it. And discarding is cool because it just kind of like cuts the process off at that point. Just kind of like saying, hey, you know, we're done with this. Don't even use this fragment in any later pipelines or anything. So this vertex shader is also mostly um, a copy, right? So it's a copy of the default vertex shader. You can see a bunch of these functions in here that are uh, importable from different Bevy WGSL scripts, but none of this really matters. What matters is this. So for our output here, which is defined as vertex output First, we have to set the colors attribute on our shader, which we'll go over in a second. And if we do that, then we get this color variable to be able to use. The big insight here is that the colors variable is an F32, which means we can pass any kind of data we want in. It doesn't have to be a color. So this is this seems to be really common in shaders. Basically, like we've got a sh we've got something called color here, but color is just a vec four of F32s. So we, any data we can pack into an F32, we can send from the vertex shader to the fragment shader to use. So in this case, we just take the vertex position for the X, Y, and Z, and we set it as the RGB values in this color. That's it. That's the only thing our, vec our vertex shader does. And then when we go to actually do the noise calculation, we use that vertex position, which is the color field, to create our noise. And what this does is it basically takes the vertices that we have on our sphere and it wraps our noise around them so that we get that nice 3D wrapping effect rather than painting the noise onto the set of pixels, 
which would be more of a 2D image. So we get that nice 3D uh, noise. And we do that here, basically. So we've got this mesh. Our mesh is a UV shape with a radius of one. Um, we use this vertex attribute values float 32 by three to eat them. Uh, I don't really know what to tell you here. This it's a thing. I don't know. We get a bunch of vertexes out of this. So uh, we basically use attribute on mesh to fetch the absolute position or the attribute position. Uh, we get a list of the vertex positions by doing this. And then we iterate over that. And in this case, we do some basic math, but this could easily just be like map zero, 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 zero. Like this is setting a color for every vertex in the sphere that gets passed in. But for us, all it's really doing is enabling the color field that we then insert our vertex position into. And then we insert this attribute. This attribute is the thing that enables this color field. So insert attribute with all of the colors. These are basically mapped from vertex to vertex by index, as far as I can tell. So like, don't reorder this. But if we look at our vertex shader, this vertex colors attribute gets enabled, at which point we can set the vertex position. And then after that, our fragment shader gets called and we can use the color, which is the vertex position to generate our noise. And that's how we get the noise wrapping around the sphere. It's a lot. I totally get that. Um, but hopefully that is helpful for somebody because it took me a while to figure out. It took me a while to figure out basically how to take this sphere and some noise and which values I needed to use to actually get a sphere wrapping uh, noise effect. Now this works for anything as well um, because we've defined it based on the vertex positions. Let's see, I've got a cube here. So this mesh, I just changed from a UV sphere to be a cube with a size of one. And if we run this again, uh, the vertex position is still being used to generate the noise. So you can see a very distinct wrapping around the edges and you can see the back faces of the cube and everything like that, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, this is, this is kind of a monstrous example. There's a lot going on here. This is not necessarily a direct tutorial. So it's just kind of a, Hey, if you're trying to write shaders, this is kind of an approach you can take to get your noise to actually wrap around the 3d objects that you're using. Um, you can't just use the fragment shader. As far as I'm aware, you have to use the fragment shader in combination with passing in the data from the vertex shader into the fragment shader so that you can use it for the noise. And I hope that you found this useful. Um, we've talked a little bit about shaders and creative coding in the past, and we'll talk about it in some more practical terms as we move forward. I think that, um, Creative coding actually has a lot of practical applications for creating things like water textures uh, in shaders and Bevy's material APIs actually make it very approachable, even though this is a lot of code and I am working off of the main branch and I did submit a PR for some of this to work. Take that for what it is. It will get easier for other people. The official release will come out. I believe that this, these shader APIs will come out in 0 0.8 and then there will be a little bit more documentation. Um, there are examples in the Bevy repo for the shaders. I encourage you to look at them and I'll see you next time. I don't know what kind of shader we're going to create next time. If you have a suggestion for a shader you'd like to see, uh, put it in the comments.